Um, for those of you that weren't here uh, over the summer, it started actually at the end of spring that um, I really sensed God was telling me that our season at the Sheraton was done. And those of you that you know, met there know where it was. If you weren't there, I mean, we met at the Sheridan Commander across the other side of Cambridge Commons for uh, over the last three years. Uh, the church was meeting there for probably about six months before Pastor Ishtar and I came, and then we've been there the whole time. And so it really felt like God said our season there was done. He opened up a door for us just for the summer. If you were here, that we were meeting at First Church in uh, their choir room, which was fine. It was good. And it felt like the God, that God said we were supposed to go unplugged, which meant we just kind of pulled a lot of the busyness and doing off the table just to focus on God and, and one another. And it was great. And we were laughing because every time we turned around, God was stripping something else away. You know, we were in a very simple room doing things very simply. Uh, just it, it was almost hilarious because every time we turned around, something else was going. And, and as we came toward the end of the summer, I just still knew that God said we were not going back to the Sheraton. And people said, where are we going? I said, I don't know. I have no idea. I just know that God has, has given me a word. And there are, those are those times where you go, okay, that was you, God, right? That was you. That wasn't just me. That wasn't just a crazy thought. And so we prayed and we just said, God, if something doesn't open, then we're going to be in the park. And we're committed to be in the park and until uh, something else opens up. And I mean, I, in the meantime... You know, if there was an opportunity, I was looking at places, talking to people. There were two places that both looked very great. They both fell through. And, and it, the first time, and I've shared this before, that I was, really, I was really disappointed when the first one did because I really felt it was like that was the spot. And so when it didn't happen, I got really disappointed. And it took me a couple of days to sort of get settled with God because I was just like, God, man, I, I was like, you promised. And... And then I remembered what God's Word says. And it comes out of Isaiah 22. It's, it's quoted again in Revelation chapter 3, where it says that He, talking about Jesus, opens doors that no man can shut, and He shuts doors that no man can open. And I thought, well, if those doors could be shut, then that must not be it. So God, I'm believing that You're going to open a door that no man can shut, and guess what? It's going to be so miraculous that we can't take credit for it. No one can take credit. It has to be just God. So here we are. We're at the end of summer. We're going into the fall. We're in the park, and we're going to be in the park, and we're like, yes. And, uh, you know, I talked with these guys, and some of the guys at YWAM, they were excited. They're, yeah, okay, we're on board, man. We're Yeah, whatever God's going to do. Well, if we're in the park, we'll be in the park. If it's snowing, we're going to be in the park, you know. And so we're just kind of like, okay, God, you know, weather doesn't really permit you to be in the park, because this isn't Southern California. Um, and so we were in the park, and then last week, it rained all day Saturday. The weather looked bad on Sunday. They let us be uh, at First Church. And then I was looking at the weather again this week, and it was looking like it wasn't going to be good. And I'm like, Lord, what are you going to do? I, I talked to First Church. No, they had something going on. We couldn't meet there. I'm like, okay, God, I, I don't know what's going on. I guess you got this thing figured out. That's Wednesday. Thursday morning, I'm just saying, God, I know that you have a place for us. I know I had, going back early uh, the week, or the end of the week before, um, some of you know, but I, I serve as one of the chaplains here at Harvard, and, and so I was with the other chaplains, and I was, or no, actually, I went into the chaplain office, and I was talking to the assistant, her name is Deb, and I just said, Deb, do you have any ideas of places we might be able to meet on campus? And so she gives me this list of several places, and she goes, I don't know, but you can check them out. Well, one of them she mentioned was this place. I didn't even know it existed. Uh, anyone that knows Harvard knows this is the Phillips Brooks house over here. I've been to Phillips Brooks house, I couldn't even tell you how many times. Walked by her, I don't know how many times. Didn't even know there was a chapel here. Never knew what it was. I just, you know, I, I, I guess I just thought it was part of the dorms. And, and so I was like, Holden Chapel. I didn't even know where it was when she mentioned it. So I'm looking, I'm calling people. They're not working. Every, every, re, every place I talked to, for some reason, it wouldn't work. A lot of them, it was because we were going to have music. And they're like, well, that room's in close proximity to classrooms. People are studying. So we don't allow any, you know, any music or loud speaking or anything there. So that didn't work. Well, I had gotten the uh, email, or actually a phone number that was supposed to be for Holden Chapel. I called this lady. She says, no, no, that's not me. Here's an email. Send an email to this person and see what they say. Sent an email. Didn't hear anything. Didn't hear anything. About three days later, I sent another email. I says, I just want to make sure I got the right email. I might have the wrong email. And, and so if this isn't the right email address for this, please let me know. Well, the next morning, I got an email back, and it was a new student leader. He had just come on for the fall, 
He says, I just got my email set up. And so he responded to my email, and he says, well, let me check and see what exactly you're planning to do, et cetera, et cetera. The weeks go on. That was like Monday of this week. Comes to Thursday, I still haven't heard from him. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm just going to reach out to him and you know, see what's going on. And I thought back, because the other two places that looked like they were going to happen, I hadn't heard from them. And when I checked back, it was when everything shifted. There was like unbelievable favor. And then when I checked back, it was like the door was shut. So there's something in me that said, oh, I don't want to do that. And I thought, no, that's fear, man. That's the enemy. That's not God. If it's God, then nobody can shut the door. So and if it's not the right door, then God's got something else. So I send an email out to him, get an answer back probably a couple hours later, and says, uh, Pastor Chris, um, that 3 to 6 o'clock window is open. There's just one conflict on it's a, it's Sunday in November. And he says, other than that, you're good to go. And I read the email. It wasn't even like, I can check, or would you like to do this? You're on the schedule. You're set. And I, I tell pastors, I say, you're not going to believe this. I go, you know, and I had actually walked by here and seen the space uh, before that. And I was just like, wow, God, that's amazing. And so here we are, we're, which if you try to find space on Harvard, it's very difficult. And it's very difficult to get them to lock something in for you for the whole school year. But we're locked in all the way through May at least. And it, it, is, a, it is a total, yeah, amen, amen. It is a total God thing that I cannot even begin to tell you just how big of a God thing that is. But then I was talking with Pastor Ishtar, and we were just thinking back to some different words that God had given us over our time here. And one of them was early on, we were at a time of prayer, and and we were talking about the promised land. And, you know, there's a lot of times in different seasons in your life personally or as churches, as ministries, that you can kind of see something as, as moving into the promised land, something God has promised. And we really felt that there was something that was, we were going to move into that was kind of like that crossing the Jordan into the promised land. And there were some things that happened. And I remember having the conversation with my wife, and she said, well, well I, I think we've passed over the Jordan. I said, no, I don't think we've passed over the Jordan yet. I, I don't know what the Jordan is, but we haven't passed over it yet. And there was something, even as we began to talk, really saying there was something so significant about this place and what God did and how he did it that I said, yes, because some of you would understand this, some of you wouldn't. But I mean, being here in Harvard Yard, on Harvard campus as a church is truly a miracle. It's truly a miracle. And, and for us to have that locked in for the whole school year is even a bigger miracle. And in many ways, this is the promised land. And I don't say that in a way looking back at Israel and, and what that meant, but spiritually. And, and I started thinking about that. And then um, Pastor Ishtar was reading in Joshua where it talks about that whole part where the second generation is, is going into the promised land across the Jordan River. And in chapter 1, it says this, which is really interesting. Now remember, this was on Thursday that I got the news that God had opened this. God is speaking to Joshua in chapter 1. He says, Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my prophet Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. I guess that's the right or the left. That you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people. Now listen to this. Verse 11. Go through the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan River here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. If you can do math, Thursday to Sunday, three days. And you go, oh, well, what is it? Well, there's something really significant. And we don't fully understand what all that means. We know that God has called us here. He has kept Grace Street Church here for 12 years. When many evangelical churches have come and gone, either gone out of business or moved to another place where it was easier. He's kept this church here. This is the first time in its history that I'm aware of that it's been on Harvard campus. I don't even know the last time at a church that met consistently on Harvard campus. I don't know. Maybe there has been. I don't know. But there's amazing significance. This place, built in 1744, it's the third oldest building on the campus of Harvard. It was built specifically 
as a chapel, a place to glorify God. The music department at Harvard now has control of it. And what happens in here most of the time is all the practices for the choral groups. They do some classes in here as well. And I started thinking about that. I thought, you know, that's interesting. Because what kind of music do most choral groups do? Hymns. Most of them do hymns. Now, they may not believe a word they're singing. But they were words written by men and women sold out to Jesus Christ to glorify God. And I thought, wow, of one of the few buildings on this campus that still God is glorified probably on a daily basis, whether they know it or not. And it was interesting because I don't know about anybody else, but when I walked in here, I actually sensed that. I mean, this place is set aside for the purposes of God. Over 250 years ago. There's so many kind of things swirling around in, you know, my mind and heart that I don't know what all God has in store. But I do know it is not by the hand of man that we are standing here today. It's not by anyone's except God's. Many of you have heard me quote 1 Corinthians 1. 27 to 31 as my life verses, that God chose the weak things to shame the strong. He chose the foolish things to shame the wise. He chose the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no man's boast may be in himself, but that his boast may be in the Lord. And, and that's what this is about, is God says, if Jesus be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. We have an opportunity And I don't think it's because of anything that we do other than being obedient, showing up, worshiping him, listening to his word, praying, getting into the word together, allowing God's spirit to engage us where we are. I want to I want to do a simple thing today that I think is I think it's significant, because if you read that story through Joshua, God tells Joshua to have the. uh, men who carried the Ark of the Covenant, the priests, to step into the river, and that when they stepped into the river, that the river would part and the the people would all walk across on dry land. And that's exactly what happened. But he then told them, too, is that while they're standing there and the water is pushed back, I want you to go back into the river, and I want you to get big 12 big rocks, one representing every tribe, and then I, go, I want you to pile them up on the, on the right side of the, the promised land side of the Jordan and make an altar. He says, why? So that every time the people come by and your kids say, hey, Dad, what's that pile of rocks? You can tell them, hey, that's where God showed up. That's where God delivered us into the promised land. That's where God had us walk across the Jordan River on dry land. It was to remember what God had done. I believe this is one of those moments for us as a church And I believe there are those moments for us as people, as individuals, where God calls us, challenges us to remember. You've heard me say before, some of you have anyway, that we have a tendency to remember what we should forget and forget what we should remember. God says, forget all the things that have been done to you or against you, your bad choices, the way people have hurt you, offended you. Forget those things. But remember where my hand has delivered you. Remember where my hand has covered you. Remember where my hand has saved you. Remember those things. And yet as people, we tend to so quickly forget those and remember all the bad things. I mean, man, somebody says something bad about you, you can remember that when you were said, it was said at four years old. We hold on to those things. And God says, let them go. They're death. Let him give life. So I want us to do something really simple is uh, I got some rocks. And there's two baskets of rocks here. If you will take one of those baskets. And I want you to get a rock. There's ones to choose from. Don't take too much time choosing. But but I want us to have a rock. Please don't throw them. (laughs) You know, we are in sort of a glass house. (laughs) But I want this to be an altar of remembrance. Now, we're not going to, you know, get 12 big rocks and put them outside the front door because they might have a problem with that. 
But I want you, not just about what God has done for us as a church, it's something that really has shifted. We believe God has called us to a new way of doing what we're called to do. We're not even, we don't even know what that is. We're figuring that out. Trusting that God knows better than we do. But I want you to think about in your own life what you need to remember. Maybe it was some of the things you were given thanks to God for just a short time ago. Maybe it's things you haven't even mentioned. Maybe there are things that only you and God have talked about that you need to remember. There's a movie. It Actually, I don't think it ever did that well. It was called Without Honors. Interestingly enough, it was about uh, Harvard. And it was uh, Joe Pesci. He was a homeless guy. And he got to know kind of an interesting way this guy that was at Harvard. And uh, they kind of became friends. And, and, and he had this bag. And one day he pulls out this bag and he, he pours out these stones. And the guy asks him, he says, what are those? He says, oh, the, these are my life. He says, what do you mean they're my life? He says, he picks up one stone. He goes, this was the best night's sleep I ever had. And he goes through every one of these. And he's remembering major moments in his life. And that's what this is about, is remembering what God did in this moment for us as a church, but what has God done for you? That when you pick this up and you look at that, you know, maybe you put it in your pocket and you carry it in your pocket for a while. Maybe you put it up on your dresser. Maybe you put it in your book bag. I don't care. Put it somewhere where you see it, where it will cause you to remember. And maybe even somebody sees you sitting here with this rock and go, what's that? Oh, let me tell you about this rock. Let me tell you about this rock. Just like he says when your kids say, hey, Dad, what's that pile of rocks? Oh, let me tell you about that pile of rocks. Let me tell you about what God has done. And it gives us an opportunity to share the way Christ has changed our life, the reality of what Christ has done in our life, that we may have an altar of remembrance. We as people are not real good at doing that, but why do we take pictures? We take pictures to remember, right? Those of you that journal, you what? You journal so that you will remember. I'm a bad journaler. and When I did journal, I never went back to read them, so I'm not sure what the purpose they actually served in my life. But I I shouldn't say that. No, there have been times where I would go back, and I would remember what God had spoken in that moment. May this even be that kind of moment. What has God done for you? What do you need to remember? What do you need to hold on to? What has God done that you need to remember? We're going to close up here in just a few moments. I want us, we will, uh, well, we'll still have offering and all that stuff here in a minute, but I want to, could you just maybe sit at the piano for a minute there? I, I want, I want us to think about this for a moment. It's what, what has God done? There's an old song. I know uh, my brother Bob would remember it. Uh, some of you might have if you grew up in church. It's count your blessings. Name them one by one. How's the next part go, Bob? See what God has done. Thank you, Carlene. See what God has done. That's what this is about. How many days do we go by that we don't count one blessing. And there were probably hundreds. I mean, we're all busy. We all got lots of stuff going on. And sometimes we're just trying to keep the big ball turning. We're like the hamster in the little wheel, man. We're spinning real fast, but we're not going much. And God says, stop. Stop. What did he tell? He said, be still and know that I am God. Can we not know God when we're moving? Well, it's possible, but usually we're moving so fast, we're not paying any attention to what God's doing. God's everywhere. He's moving all the time. He's blessing us in a hundred ways all the time. May we stop and say, God, I'm so blessed. I am so blessed. Some of you have an opportunity at an education your parents never had. 
Some of you have relationships in your life that you never thought you would actually have friends like that. Some of you, you look back at your life, it was such a wreck, and God has turned it around, you can't even believe it yourself. But when was the last time we said, man, thank you, God. God, I remember. I remember when you did this. God, remember? Do you ever remind God? God, remember when you did that? Do you remember when you did that? Our son will do that. He said, Dad, Dad, you remember? You remember that? Our Heavenly Father would really like for us to do that. He doesn't need us to do that. But just say, man, God, thank you. Thank you, God. Man, I deserve so much less, and you, God, you hooked me up. Because God, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights. Not some of them, not most of them, every good, every good gift. God gets blamed for all kinds of crazy stuff. He doesn't get a lot of credit for the good stuff. But every good thing that comes into our life comes from his hand. Would you hold your rock and just pray with me? Would you repeat this prayer? Lord Jesus, I choose to remember. I choose to count my blessings. Name them. Thank you for them. Help me every day to start off giving thanks. Not complaining. Not worried. Not stressed. But giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is your will for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. May you choose to take this little altar of remembrance. May it be more than just a rock. May it be more than just a moment. But may it be a reminder of how much God loves you. How much He has done for you. How He calls you. His son, His daughter. I love that even as we were reminded last night that when Jesus came into the Jordan River to be baptized by John, it says that the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and God the Father spoke. He says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus hasn't done one thing yet. He hasn't saved one person. He hasn't healed one person. He hasn't delivered one person. He has done nothing except live 30 years as a normal person on this earth. And God says, it's my son whom I'm well pleased. Understand what we do for God does not bring him pleasure. Who we are and trusting that we are his sons and his daughters. He's pleased with you because he loves you. He created you. He called you. That's all that matters. That's that's not part of it. That's all of it. That's not some of the story. That is the story. I once was lost, but now... I'm found. I don't have to wonder anymore. I want you to just real quick, close your eyes, because I just I want to ask if there'd be anybody, even as I say that. Is there anybody here that maybe you have not known that God loved me? Maybe you never have accepted His love. You've never asked Christ to come into your life to acknowledge that He gave His life for you. He loved you so much, He died for you. His blood was shed for your sins as it was for all of ours. Is there anybody that would raise their hand and say, yes, that's me. That's me. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to accept and acknowledge His love for me. Is there anybody that would raise their hand today and say, yes, yes, that's me. May we sing this proclaiming 
that he is lifted high. God, may we lift you higher. God, may we not lift ourselves up, but may we lift you up. God, not just in the words we say, but in the lives that we live. Lord, that we would love people with the love that you have given us, the way that you've loved us, that they would know and see that you love them, you created them, you desire a relationship with them. God, let us lift Let us live up to your level, not down to our own. Let us love people up to your level, not down to our own. God, may we live a life for you, Lord, lifting you higher that people will know you and see you. Oh, we pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Have a seat real quick. Just a couple things. To uh, mention, um, if you are 
um, with us for the first time in college and students and young people for decades, and he has such a heart. I mean, four decades. He started when he was five, and uh, and so we just uh, thank the Lord for him and just give us a quick word because we got about like two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Yeah. So this will be a miracle. All right. Well, let me just pray for you. I just got back from China. The most exciting meeting, 14,000 Chinese leaders for the first time met together. There was all kinds of division for the first time, all in unity. They all came out publicly. These are the fathers and the uncles of uh, over 100 million Christians. And they all came on the stage together in Hong Kong. I was, by invitation only, we, they, these people were invited. And it was a very historic meeting. And it, I believe the Lord has spoke to me that the future Prime Minister of China will be saved here on this campus and will go back and become the Prime Minister within 15 or so years and bring China into a national revival. Folks, uh, this is the greatest hour for revival in the history of the world. And, uh, you know, for five or six years I've been coming up. Uh, I was one of the ones that had been mentoring Z Zenzo, encouraging him. When I got here, he, he was making 10,000 U.S. dollars a, a year. And no one would even give him a job to lead worship. And I prophesied over him. I said, son, you've been called. you got an apostolic anointing. You are a mighty man of God. And I break off that, that and I release that gift of faith on his life. And, folks, I just want to release that gift of faith on your life. This is the hour of a great harvest for Harvard. Lift your hand. I'm going to pray for you right now. Come on, lift them up high. I claim in the mighty name of Jesus. I say to every mountain of fear, anxiety, and worry to be gone. And we're going to seek first the kingdom, and everything we need is going to be added to us. We declare a harvest. It's not about us. It's about Jesus and the kingdom, and about Harvard students and MIT students and the 100,000 students that are here. Lord, let them be saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, 188 nations here studying, and Lord, we're going to see him saved, discipled, and sent back to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We give you glory and praise for Pastor Chris and his awesome wife and all the team here, and we declare hundreds will be saved at Grace Tree this semester for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, uh, yes. <laughs> so... God bless you. This is a, a this is a historic moment for us as a church. We know it. There's things that have shifted, and things have been happening in the spirit. We're starting to see it play out in the natural, and we got some uh, flyers. Can you get that up right there? There's some flyers back over there, just talking about you know that we're here now. So grab some of those. Bring your family, friends, anybody you meet. Put them uh, to give them to anybody. Tell them Jesus has an appointment for them. Well, I love you, and if you can uh, stick around, help us. Pull it down and uh, take it all out so we're out of here by six. All right, guys. Love you. God bless you.